Among the most famous names in aviation history, Braniff International was a carrier whose history stretched from the 1920s to the 1990s, and in that time came under various guises as the company was restarted six times, while also presenting a varied fleet of aircraft ranging from standard American commercial airliners to the brief use of the supersonic Concorde. The Braniff Company takes its name from company founder Paul Revere Braniff, who incorporated his namesake airline originally on April 26, 1926 in Oklahoma City. Although the first iteration of the carrier was dissolved soon afterwards, replaced instead by Paul R. Braniff Incorporated on May 29, 1928, after joining forces with his brother, insurance magnate Thomas Elmer Braniff, who helped to finance the project, the maiden flight of this new firm being on June 20th of the same year from Oklahoma City to Tulsa, using a single-engined five-passenger Stinson Detroiter, flown by Paul Braniff himself, although the return working was delayed due to thunderstorms. In April 1929, the Braniff brothers transferred control of the company to the Universal Aviation Corporation, although they remained pivotal figures within the firm's operation, and the company was renamed Braniff Airlines Incorporated, the Universal Company being a conglomerate of smaller airlines and railways that intended to open up coast-to-coast -coast corridors across the southern United States. Before eventually being purchased by the Aviation Corporation, or AVCO firm, a holding company that had controlling shares in other mainstream US carriers such as American Airlines. Although the Braniff name disappeared after the AVCO purchase, the Braniff brothers restarted the firm for the third time in November 1930 as Braniff Airways, commencing new airmail contracts from Oklahoma City to Tulsa and Wichita Falls, expanding through 1931 to include Kansas City, St. Louis and Chicago, before shutting down all operations briefly in 1933 to reorganize their operations into a passenger carrier, Braniff employees agreeing to work without pay for just under a year before the company was restarted for the fourth time in 1934. Later that year, after petitions made by General Manager Paul Braniff to the U.S. Postmaster General in Washington, D.C., the airline became the first U.S. carrier to be awarded an airmail route in the wake of the airmail scandal, taking on the highly profitable Chicago to Dallas airmail service, which helped to secure the firm financially, and in 1935 became the first U.S. carrier to operate flights between Chicago and the Mexican border, acquiring in the same year Dallas-based Long and Harmon Airlines, which extended the company's operations into Texas. With this, further acquisitions followed, starting with Bowen Airlines in January 1936, which opened up a Chicago to Houston via St. Louis, Springfield, Tulsa and Dallas Corridor, and a new route from Dallas to San Antonio with stops in Fort Worth and Austin, while during World War II, Braniff provided the US Army Air Force with both its fleet of Douglas DC-2 and DC-3 airliners for use as troop transports, and was also awarded contracts to operate military cargo flights between Brownsville, Texas and Panama City on what was known as the Banana Run, named due to the agreements made between the carriers and Panamanian banana producers to ship their produce to the United States for sale, although this service did not commence until after the end of the war. At the same time, Thomas Braniff briefly started a Mexican-based division of the company called Erovias Braniff in 1943, commencing operations from Nuevo Laredo in Mexico to Monterrey and Mexico City in March 1945, although attempts to merge the Mexican and American elements of the Braniff company were stymied when the Mexican government suspended Erovias Braniff's operating permits in October 1946, following pressure from Pan American Airways, the Civil Aeronautics Board, or CAB, also blocking the proposal before Mexican Braniff operations ceased in 1947. With the end of the war in 1945, Braniff expanded rapidly across Latin America, South America, and the Caribbean, opening up new corridors in competition with Pan Am between Dallas and Houston to Havana, Lima, Rio de Janeiro, La Paz, and Buenos Aires adopting the Braniff International Airways name to reflect its new operations south of the border, while also introducing Douglas DC-4s retrofitted with Jet Assisted Takeoff, or JATO, for use out of La Paz. By 1952, Braniff flew out of 29 airports in the USA, and worked flights up to four times a week via Havana to Central and South America, followed by further expansion after acquiring the Kansas City-based Mid-Continent Airlines in August of that year, opening up routes to Minneapolis-St. Paul, Sioux City, Des Moines, Omaha, St. Louis, Tulsa, Shreveport, and New Orleans, expanding the company to a fleet of 75 aircraft and over 4,000 employees, including 400 pilots, making it the 10th largest US airline by passenger miles and 9th largest by domestic passenger miles. Sadly, the 1950s was also marred with misfortune for the company. The expansion of the South American network, the Mid-Continent Airlines merger, and the reduction of mail subsidies on the Mid-Continent system meaning Braniff was operating at a $1.8 million loss 
against a meager $11,000 net income during 1953. Although this was remedied in 1954 by a negotiated increase in male subsidies made by Thomas Braniff, one of his final corporate actions prior to his untimely death on January 10th of the same year during the crash of his flying boat on the shore of Wallace Lake, Louisiana, while a year later, Paul Braniff would succumb to cancer, leaving the firm in the hands of Executive Vice President Charles Edmund Beard. With Beard at the helm, he led the company into the jet age by purchasing five Boeing 707s, although only four were received, as the fifth crashed under test with Boeing, followed in the early 1960s by shorter-range Boeing 720s and the British-built BAC-111 regional airliners, the longer-range Boeing 707-320C being the face of Braniff's intercontinental services, while all propeller-driven airliners were out of service by May 1969. Boeing 707s and 720s, though, were the least of Braniff's ambitions, as in April 1964, the firm made a deposit on two Boeing 2707 supersonic transports at a cost of $100,000 per aircraft, proposals being to open supersonic corridors on the Latin American service, although this ultimately came to naught when the SST program, running far behind schedule and over budget, was axed by the Nixon administration in 1971, the US government having partially supported the project since its inception under the Kennedy administration a decade earlier. In 1964, Beard was replaced by Harding Lawrence, former executive vice president of Continental Airlines, after Braniff, together with the National Car Rental Company, was acquired by Troy Post's Great America Corporation, this Dallas-based insurance holding company, seeking to expand firms which had been deemed undermanaged and underutilized, the conservative running of the Braniff firm having been cited as the primary reason why the airline struggled to grow significantly during the jet age. Under Lawrence's management, Braniff was given an image overhaul by advertising consultants Jack Tinker and Partners, which included a new series of red, white, and blue liveries, and a revised uniform designed by Italian fashion company Emilio Pucci, while the next 15 years of the firm's history saw widespread expansion into new markets, resulting in record financial and operating performance, despite load factors that, on average, only hovered around 50%. With its new livery of 15 colours, which were applied to aircraft exteriors, interiors, gate lounges, ticket offices, and the corporate headquarters, the firm rebuilt its jet fleet to include additional Boeing 727s and, from 1970, Boeing 747-100s that commenced work on the Dallas to Honolulu run, flying up to 15 hours per day with a 99% dispatch reliability rate, complemented in 1979 by the addition of the strange shortened Boeing 747-SP variant, which was introduced on new routes to Europe and the Far East. In 1978, Braniff once again became acquainted with supersonic flight when, as part of an interchange agreement with Air France and British Airways, the company was allowed to operate the brand new Aerospatiale BAC Concorde on domestic services between Washington DC and Dallas, the provisions of this agreement being that Braniff flight crew and cabin crew would take over from French and British crews at Washington, while only being allowed to fly subsonically across the continental USA due to the fear of sonic booms. Sadly, the ambition of the Concorde operation outweighed practical reality, as these flights often flew with only 15 passengers aboard the 100-seat airliners, while presenting fuel expenses that far exceeded conventional domestic models, and a mere 10-minute improvement in journey times over the regular service flown by Boeing 727s, the last of these costly flights being undertaken on June 30, 1980. Misfortune continued with the new decade, as Braniff's phenomenal run of expansion and profitability ended with the deregulation of the American airline industry in October 1978, meaning that the previous monopoly held by the select few mainline carriers of the United States was now broken up into a free market of startup companies that could undercut the established giants, Lawrence's belief being that the best form of defense was to expand Braniff into a wide variety of new markets, enlarging the domestic network by 50% by adding 16 new cities and 32 new routes in December of that year. Though this expansion was initially successful, rising fuel costs caused by the 1979 oil crisis in the wake of the Iranian Revolution meant the operational losses of the firm rose from $39 million during that year to $120 million in 1980 and $107 million in 1981, while the introduction of international hubs in Boston and Los Angeles, created with the hope of handling increased travel outside North America, failed to recoup their delivery costs as international passenger traffic struggled to recover meaning the company's widespread 747 operations flew nearly empty. This, combined with the expense of the company's brand new gigantic headquarters called Braniff Place, meant the firm's 1970s profits were wiped clean by 1980. And, in the face of a crippling loss, all 747 services to Asia and Europe, with the exception of non-stop flights between Dallas-Fort Worth and London, 
as well as International 747 operations to Bogota, Buenos Aires and Santiago, were discontinued by 1981. Following the retirement of Lawrence in the summer of the same year, John Casey became president of the Braniff Company, but attempts to expand the firm's capacity were hampered during a sudden strike by the Professional Air Traffic Controllers Organization, or PATCO, the subsequent drop in air traffic only serving to exacerbate Braniff's existing problems and forcing Casey to implement the Braniff Strike Back campaign in the autumn of 1981, streamlining the carrier's fare structure into a two-tier system called Braniff Premier and Braniff Coach, the Premier service providing a first class together with the regular coach class, while the coach service was an all-economy operation with reduced fares although this proposal was ultimately unsuccessful and pushed business travellers to other airlines. The failure of the Braniff Strikes Back campaign led swiftly to Casey's replacement as president by former Southwest Airlines president Howard A. Putnam, Putnam accepting on the condition that his own financial manager, Philip Guthrie, be allowed to follow him across from Southwest, his immediate action being to introduce a one-fare structure plan called the Texas Class Campaign, but this again resulted in decreases in the airline's revenue dropping from over $100 million per month to $80 million, while also removing the revenue structure that allowed the carrier to maintain its cash requirements, leading to the company recording its first negative cash flow in January 1982 and significant losses to competitors at its Dallas-Fort Worth hub. With money hemorrhaging, Putnam sold a one-year lease on the company's Latin American network to Eastern Airlines on June 1, 1982 for $18 million, $11 million up front and $7 million by the end of 1982 while Braniff itself retained Venezuelan services and established a bilateral agreement with American Airlines on the Brazilian routes. But before any of these proposals came to pass, Braniff finally ran out of money and collapsed into bankruptcy on May 11th after Putnam failed to gain a court injunction to stop a threatened pilot strike, all operations ceasing the next day and bringing an end to 54 years of service, the final flight of the original Braniff International being Flight 501 from Honolulu to Dallas. With the collapse of Braniff, the former assets of the airline were acquired under an approved corporate reorganization agreement with the Hyatt Hotel Company, under which the carrier was brought out of bankruptcy on December 15, 1983, with a total capitalization of $100 million, $70 million from Hyatt, and $30 million in Airways assets, the revived firm being established in Nevada as a subsidiary of the Dalfort Corporation, a holding company of which Hyatt owned an 80% share. And by the time the new Braniff, the fifth incarnation of the airline, undertook its inaugural flight on March 1st, 1984, it served 18 destinations from its Dallas hub, making it the largest single-day successful airline startup in US history. Unlike the previous Braniff, the new airline was solely a domestic operation and aimed to provide a lower-cost competitor to traditional giants such as Eastern and American Airlines, employing 2,200 people while also taking up a vast order of 50 Airbus A320s from the ailing Pan Am to replace the aging Boeing 727s that formed the backbone of its services, but sadly losses were quickly encountered as the new Braniff struggled to maintain its position against low-cost carriers such as People Express and Piedmont. In 1989, Braniff acquired the Orlando-based Florida Express, a regional carrier with an extensive network across the southeast United States, creating Braniff Express and in so doing seeing the move of the company headquarters from Dallas to Orlando. But despite much promise in the Braniff Express expansion, as well as being the first American airline to introduce the Airbus A320, the revived Braniff filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in September of the same year, laying off 2,700 of its 4,700 employees, followed on November 6 by the suspension of all services, Braniff stuttering on with fragmented operations until the end of December, after which the company agreed to liquidate all its assets in three separate auctions. Again though, this wasn't the end of Braniff. The name was revived for a sixth time in 1990, under the ownership of parent company BIA Core Holdings, a holding company founded by financiers Jeffrey Chodoro, Arthur Cohen, and Scott Spencer. Spencer being a controversial figure in commercial aviation due to his handling of the previous incarnation of Braniff and his criminal past, having been arrested repeatedly in 1988 for writing bad checks and failing to return a rental car, followed in May 1990 by another arrest under the same rental car warrant, for which he was released after posting a $1,000 bond. Under the BIA core holding firm, Braniff International Airlines was created, but due to the checkered past of Scott Spencer, the US Department of Transport, or US DOT, refused to allow the carrier an operating certificate, forcing the company to instead purchase the assets of the bankrupt Texan airline Emerald Air, and in so doing acquire that carrier's operating certificate, though Braniff would still refuse a certificate by the US DOT so long as Spencer was attached to the company. Eventually, 
Braniff's directors were forced to sign sworn affidavits in May 1991, ensuring the US DOT that the revived Braniff company would in no way involve the influence of Spencer, and thus the carrier was granted its operating certificate, launching flights on July 1, 1991, with five Boeing 727s and three Douglas DC-9s. But 15 days later, services to Los Angeles ceased, following an unexplained failure to secure proper permanent passenger handling facilities at the airport, meaning the airline had neither access to a gate or a ticket counter. Then, only 37 days after restarting service under the Braniff name, the company filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy on August 7th, in part due to the loss of its LAX services, but also after the sudden end of a charter contract with an unnamed Canadian tour company, followed on September 12th by the withdrawal of operations out of Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport, although these setbacks weren't enough to end the firm, and it continued to operate under bankruptcy protection through late 1991 and into 1992. Ultimately, third-party injections of cash and an ambitious new schedule did nothing to save the ailing firm, and on July 2nd, 1992, after only a year of operations, Braniff ceased all services for the final time, with stranded passengers being refunded their ticket fares five days later, while Continental Airlines, United and America West, offered to fly Braniff's customers on a standby basis for $75, with legal wrangling in the wake of Braniff's collapse continuing as late as 1996, as the US DOT and Federal Aviation Administration had been informed that Spencer had secretly broken the conditions of the airline's operating certificate by allowing him the ability to influence corporate decisions, a violation of the director's signed affidavits that saw Spencer sentenced to a 51-month prison term, followed by three years of supervised release and a $115,000 restitution to the bankruptcy trustees. Beyond Braniff itself, upon the collapse of the airline's longest iteration in 1982, many ex-Braniff employees, including pilots and flight attendants, established a Minnesota-based low-cost carrier dubbed Sun Country Airlines in January 1983, which has, from its original fleet of a single Boeing 727, gone on to become one of America's most successful low-cost airlines, which continues to do battle with the likes of Southwest Airlines, while ex-Braniff executives, including the former vice president of the company Thomas B. King, formed Fort Worth Airlines in December 1984, a short-lived venture that utilized Japanese-built Namc YS-11 turboprops for services across Texas, but this operation was wrapped up in September 1985 following bankruptcy. In the end, Braniff and its six revivals would leave among the most famous legacies in American airline history both for its incredible success on the Latin American and South American markets during the 1960s and 70s, but also for its spectacular collapse and various restarts during the 1980s and 90s, being the face of the phenomenal success granted by the regulated US commercial aviation market, but also a staple of the fallout that came following deregulation, a sign that the world of US carriers would never be the same again.